Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about the organism Trichinella spiralis, or as you might have heard of it before, the organism that causes trichinosis. Um, I wasn't originally planning on teaching any parasites, um, but it turned out that pathology was planning on covering some of the muscle pathology that we associate with parasites. So I thought this was a good place to begin talking about some of the muscular parasites. We'll talk about more of them throughout in other videos, um, but I thought I'd do this one quick because it really fits well with kind of what we're talking about in this week's cases. So Trichinella spiralis, or the organism that causes trichinosis, or sometimes it's called trichinellosis, um, is actually most historically associated with the consumption of undercooked pork. So for all of you barbecue lovers out there, as we're getting closer to summer, when you're going to be firing up that grill again, make sure that you're cooking your meat um, to a safe temperature and that you're storing it at safe temperatures before you cook it. Okay, so just some common characteristics. First off, it's a parasite, so it can live within us quite happily. Um, second off, it's a eukaryotic organism, like many of our parasites. Um, and this one is actually a multicellular organism, because this one is actually a nematode. Um, that also tells you something else. It's a worm, as is shown here. So you can see it's got kind of a large structure. It's a round worm. Um, and like all of the parasites, there are two things I absolutely require you know. You need to know its infective form and you need to know its diagnostic form. In this case, it's very, very simple because both the infective form and the diagnostic form are the same. It's this guy. This is an encysted larvae that we're finding in striated muscle. So you can diagnose it kind of in two ways. You can diagnose it in your patient if you actually take like a biopsy of their muscle um, and then you're able to find this, you know, encysted larvae. Or you can actually go and look at the food that might have been the cause of their disease and look for the encysted larvae. That's actually what's done during epidemics. So um, typically, if we see a whole bunch of trichinosis in the US, we're going to go back to some sort of shared meat supplier, typically of pork again, um, and look for the larvae within that particular food um, so that we can kind of track down the source, remove it from the market, and encourage people who have maybe been been exposed to keep an eye out for symptoms. Okay, so as I always say, with the exception of malaria, where parasites are concerned, you don't actually need to know the entire life cycle, but you do need to know the infective and the diagnostic form. So like I said before, largely and historically, this has been associated with pigs. Um, pigs were kind of the largest culprit of this in the past. Um, and today it is still kind of what we associate with trichinosis. Certainly for step, it's most likely to be a pig that they would include in the stem. The pig eats something probably from some sort of rodent um, that leads to the pig's muscle being insisted with these larvae. Okay, so then um, you go and you buy yourself some ribs and the intercostal muscles of the pig are essentially what you're eating at that point, right? So then you eat that muscle over here and it's got the insisted larvae in it and then it moves into your digestive tract. So what happens is the larvae will leave the meat once it gets into your small intestine intestine. And in your small intestine, it's going to take two days for these larvae to become adult worms. Once they're adult worms, boy meets girl and fertilizes girl, the female worm can produce up to 1,500 larvae in one to three months. Now, these larvae want to go out and explore their brand new world, so they're going to head over to different body sites. And they have some preferences. Um, they seem to like the extraocular area, the tongue, the deltoids, and pectorals. I'm probably drawing in all the wrong places. Talk to your local anatomist if this doesn't look right. Um, the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, all of these various places. The other places they might go that are actually fairly serious would be your heart, right? Your heart is certainly a muscle, so you could certainly have larvae there. 
So um, as I said before, we associate this with pigs, but actually 90% of modern trichinella cases or trichinosis cases in the United States come from bears. Um, my husband loves to watch these like Alaska's last frontier shows and whatnot. And one of the things that I see them do is go out bear hunting. Um, a bear is a sizable amount of meat for a family throughout the winter. Um, and bears eat in the wild. So they're picking up all sorts of odd things. And actually about six years ago, the state of Montana reported that two of its counties, 100% of the bears tested positive for this parasite. So even though we normally associate it with pigs, we can also find it in kind of wild game meat throughout the United States. So that would include bears, but also wild boars. And actually, oddly enough, walruses have been known to carry the parasite. So all sorts of places where you can find this. Um, so when we're talking about this, we need to think about where we're actually going to see the parasite that's actually going to give you a clue as to type of disease that you might see. All right, so the clinical syndrome that we see with trichinosis or trichinellosis is actually dependent on the tissue burden, okay? So many patients are just going to have kind of a mild asymptomatic or self-limited syndrome, kind of flu-like, and then they'll get better. However, if you have more extensive larval burden, then you're going to have more severe symptoms. And that can include kind of, you know, normal symptoms like fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, and muscle pain. We also tend to see marked eosinophilia in patients suffering from trichinosis. And think about this. This makes complete sense. Eosinophils are rather large um, immune cells, and they are actually created to kind of combat these really large parasites. Um, and that's kind of their whole deal, is being able to degranulate and dispose of these really large parasites that our bodies just aren't equipped to handle otherwise. So what happens is the eosinophils um, are going to be used um, extensively. You might also, with time, except, expect to see a lot of IgE, right, because those are often associated with eosinophils. And certainly in the area, you'll see recruitment of mast cells, um, which can also exacerbate symptoms in the area by increasing the inflammation. But the eosinophilia is the big part. Now, because the larvae have certain sites that they love to go to, you're going to see this increase in periorbital edema if it's going to the eye. Um, you can also see um, kind of inflammation at different muscle sites. Now, if it goes to the heart, which is what I'm showing here, this is actually the heart from a patient with um, trichinosis, um, you're going to see myocarditis, certainly. Um, and with that, you can see splinter hemorrhages, right? Just like we talked about with um, some of the bacterial causes of myocarditis and um, bacterial endocarditis. Now, some patients will also see um, migration to the brain. And when that happens, you get encephalitis, which leads to psychosis psychosis, meningoencephalitis, and sometimes cerebrovascular accident. And all of those certainly can lead to death. Lethal trichinosis actually occurs when myocarditis and um, encephalitis and pneumonitis, actually, when it affects the lungs. These are going to be the worst lungs in the history of lungs ever drawn. All get infected because then basically you have shut down of all of these major organisms or all of these major organs, excuse me. Um, so the patient in this case could die within four to six weeks after infection. Basically, respiratory arrest is what occurs. Um, and that's because the respiratory arrest actually occurs due to um, invasion of the diaphragm, right? Because we need the diaphragm to contract in order for our lungs to fill, right? So if you don't have, if you have a heavy um, larval burden in that muscle, it's actually going to shut down the ability to breathe correctly. Um, these are, uh, this is actually a patient with um, trichinosis, trichinosis that I believe was seen at Mayo Clinic. And you actually, you see all of this like, discharge, the purulence coming from the eye. It looks like um, more like bacterial conjunctivitis, but really what you're seeing here is just kind of the mast granulation that's happening as a result of both the eosinophils and probably the mast cells that are responding to the larval burden in and around the eyes. 
Okay, so how do we treat it? How do we diagnose it? Um, so I'm going to start with diagnosis, even if though it's at the bottom here. Typically, we're going to diagnose it with just clinical observations and being aware of whether or not there's an outbreak. Um, so outbreaks are actually kind of where we look for it. Otherwise, you're probably not going to think about it too much. Um, and so there are certain places of the world where you might think of it more, per perhaps if you're in an area with a heavy hunting population, but otherwise um, you're really only thinking about it during an outbreak. Um, for that, you're once again going to look for the encysted larvae, either in your patient or in what they were exposed to. Um, if you see um, marked eosinophilia in a patient with all of these symptoms, then maybe this goes on your list and you might try to look for encysted larvae. You could also do serology. Serology will be present from about the third week, though. So your patient would have been sick for quite a while before you actually saw um, the 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 serologic um, evidence, right? So it could be a couple of weeks. And then once they've had it, they're pretty much going to have it for years, right? So even if they were exposed years ago and then suddenly, um, you know, now they're showing symptoms, what if years ago they had it and they recovered from it and now you're just seeing it and it's not trichinosis? So serology isn't really, um, isn't especially diagnostic, but if you see it, and the patient has eosinophilia, and especially if there's an outbreak, then it might be worth looking for those encysted larvae. All right, so how do we treat it? Thankfully, most cases don't require treatment. Um, as I said before, most cases are mild or asymptomatic. If you do need to treat it because your patient has a significantly high larval burden or they have very severe um, you know, severe symptoms, then you might use mebendazole or albendazole plus prednisone. The prednisone is actually there more to kind of support um, the breathing and the muscles, but um, you might try using those. The better thing to do is to never catch it in the first place. So always freeze your food, cook your food, um, try to prevent it, don't catch it. That's kind of the big deal here. And that's all I have on trichinosis.